We have five pitches. We had 40 applications to share these big ideas with all of you. Our board narrowed it down to five, and they're, all, they're each going to get five minutes to share their big idea. So each one will come up one at a time. They're very, very unique problem-solving ideas. And they're going to share their idea. They each get five minutes. They get five slides on the screen. And one person will win $5,000. One person will win $1,000. And another will win $1,000. But all of them really win because they get to platform their idea in front of all of you. Now, here's what I promised all of them. They were nervous about being on this stage, or a few of them. So I promised them that this audience, all 650 of you, would be their biggest fans. Okay? So when I, when I introduce each of them, I want you to give like a roaring, I mean like not really long, but roaring kind of uh, applause. And when they're done, really applause them. And even if you don't like their idea, just clap for them, please. Um, and so our judges tonight, we have Chet Burge, he's right here. And Chet is the uh, founder of Burge and & Associates. And he's an incredible accountant and indicator. He does all of our books. And he's also donating some accounting services to the winners uh, tonight also. We have Blake Patton. And Blake, we just met. And Blake um, is a managing partner at Tech Square Partners. So he understands investing in businesses. And then third, we have Chris Bledsoe. He's a serial entrepreneur, a new friend of mine, and has um, really started and sold multiple businesses. So he understands how to do this. We have Wade from Sun and & Sons, and, and Sun and & Sons is hosting our after party tomorrow at their place. He's a branding expert. He's the founder and creative director at Sun and & Sons. You'll hear more about them tomorrow. And then we have Brittany Toms, and Brittany is from C-Spark Go, an incredible PR agency that we use, and she is also donating um, PR services to the winners. All in all, tonight we're going to give away $25,000 of money and services to these winners. Okay. So here we go. Five minutes on the clock for the first person. I want to see their presentation so that we know that it's ready. Come on up. We'll get the microphone ready. Again, again remember, you're like their biggest fan, right? Can we, can we move this off to you so we have make sure that's all clear? Awesome. Okay, so our first presentation is... Prissy Tomboy, and this is Tracy Pearson. <laughs> Sixty-six percent of girls ages 12 to 15 do not meet adequate fitness standards, according to the CDC. Think about if girls do not feel good about themselves physically, how do you think they feel mentally? especially at a time when they're trying to find their identity. Being the mother of two active boys, I've noticed the lack of girls playing outside. So I took upon myself to find out why. I talked to the mothers, I talked to the daughters, I joined the health and fitness committees at the schools to find out. And there is a pattern in their responses. I don't have time. I'm not an athlete. My friends aren't playing anymore. But I also found a pattern in behavior. Girls are finding a way to deal with stress by escaping what's in their palm of their hands. They are watching life. They are not living life. At a time when it's, they're trying to find out who they are, they have become obsessed with what society is pressuring them to feel like they should look like or who they should be like. They have lost the space to find out who they are. Prissy Tomboy. You're probably wondering what is a Prissy Tomboy. I am a Prissy Tomboy. My father named me Prissy Tomboy when I was a little girl. I was that girly girl that loved sports, that loved adventure. I was a girl athlete, and I fought to be treated like a girl athlete. Being a girl athlete has given me the athletic drive to be a leader. Do you know that 80% of women are key leaders in Fortune 500, in Fortune 500 companies participated in sports in their youth. So what is it about sports that makes great leaders? It is that moment when you're trying to finish that last mile. It is that, it's that moment where you're trying to get to the top of that mountain. It is that moment when you're pushing yourself physically and mentally. It is that space where you find out who you really are and where you gain faith in the strength of a girl. That is essential for a woman leader. 
We just launched our ambassador program in March, and we have been inundated with girls writing to us that want to be part of our ambassador program. They are yearning for a platform to share their stories, their inspiration, and find a community to build their passion for why they believe in sports and becoming leaders. They want to change the face of their generation to strong females, strong girls that play sports and have a passion. Our philosophy is we put them in a place of leadership, they will become leaders. So our goal and our support is to keep these girls in sports to college level. We have what we like to call Miss Pris, which is our lovely van that you see here. And we take this to national sporting events across the country. We spotlight girl athletes and share their stories at these events, as well as share our brand awareness and sell our brand merchandise to get the funds to host clinics for girls to try different sports. The lack of know-how, we want to give them opportunities to be able to have a non-competitive, non-intimidating way to try such things as mountain biking, rock climbing, paddleboarding, surfing, sports that are mostly male-dominated, and they're taught to, as males, we're gonna teach them as females. We're gonna teach them as girls and give them a platform to try these different sports. Going to the sporting events, we also found a need. The girls are in the salt water and they're in the dirt, they're in the mud, they're getting bit by bugs. So we created a beauty line called Play Pretty to support those girl athletes. It'll be one of the first beauty lines that are made specifically for female athletes, which also gives us a platform to feature more of our ambassadors to change the face of their generation. Our clinics have become so successful and are in such high demand that we are now launching the Prissy Tomboy Challenge. The Prissy Tomboy Challenge will be the, be the first, will be in Atlanta at Georgia Tech at their challenge course. The Prissy Tomboy Challenge would be a event where they can work as a team to challenge themselves and define their strength. We will also have, we also have committed group of college recruiters, professional women athletes. We have women who have made health and fitness part of their lifestyle. They will speak to them about all the issues that want to pull them out of sports. And with the $5,000, we'll be able to fund this event and be able to scholarship 50 girls to attend this event. As for me, sports was the only way that I was going to be able to pay for college. And from some, for a lot of these girls, that is their only opportunity. So let's give them that opportunity and that support so they can reach that goal to have a bright future. Awesome. Okay, Chet, do you, uh, yeah, you have a microphone. Okay, Chet, do you have a follow-up question? One sec. Yeah, one follow-up question. Good job. Um, can you, or do you have a uh, story or an anecdote about a young lady who's connected with your brand and therefore she's put the phone down and gone outside and played or tried a sport or something like that? I have so many stories I can share with you that can be found at PrissyTomboy.com on the website. But um, we have a young lady that's part of the para climbing team. Her name is Nicole, very shy. And once we supported her and told her how beautiful she was as an athlete, she came to our first photo shoot for our beauty line and was excited to represent herself. We also had Olympic hopeful that by putting her in our social media, she was able to get the votes to be able to go to a camp in Lake Placid for freestyle skiing to, be, um, to get trained for her to be a future Olympic hopeful. That's great. Thank you, Tracy. Awesome. Okay, our second problem solving idea is called Spark Market. And um, Marcus Kennedy is going to be presenting. Please welcome Marcus to the stage. Okay, so here's the deal. I'm limping. So every morning I get up at like 5.30 and I do seven and a half miles. And today I pull a muscle in my calf. So clearly a sign of good luck, right? <laughs> Let's talk about what I'm really here for. And that's to talk about growth capital. And considering this room, I think this is something that everyone is very familiar with because you guys are innovators. You guys have good ideas. You have successful small businesses. So you're familiar and sensitive to the fact that 
growth capital is increasingly difficult to come by. So you have the suppliers of that growth capital, and that's traditionally banks, credit unions, and to some degree, angel investors. And then you, got, you have you guys, the demanders of that growth capital, and there's a divide that's happening between you two. We believe, Spark Market believes, that alternative finance can help serve as a bridge between this growing divide. And you're already familiar with alternative finance because most of you have probably heard of crowdfunding. And that's the vertical that I really want to focus on this evening. See, crowdfunding is, of course, getting small sums of money behind an idea, and hopefully that idea goes on and blossoms, becomes a business, and that business takes off. What then? They're going to need further growth capital. I want to introduce you to what I'm really here for, and that's to talk about investment crowdfunding. I believe it's the next evolutionary step in this new form of uh, capital attainment. So no longer do you have to settle for swag, the sunglasses, the t-shirts. Now you have an opportunity to get something more substantial in return. So what I'm saying is, as an investor, I can give you, the entrepreneur, cash, and in return, you'll give me a share in your business. I'll give you a loan and you'll give me a, let's say, an 8% rate of return. So this is a real investment. This is what Spark Market does. We facilitate these sorts of investment crowdfunding transactions. Okay, so we've, we've created an interface which is very familiar to those, those of you who may have been on Kickstarter, et cetera. So you go to a campaign page, you see something you like, you can choose a t-shirt, a sunglass, and for a business, this is good because, you know, you capture some income there, but I'll get behind an ideal to a, the tune of, say, 500 or a grand if it's really substantial, and I want to be a part of that. Think about those local businesses around you that are really taking off, or restaurants that are really taking off. What if you could have got on the ground floor? For me, I wish I would have got in on King of Pops. But let's talk about something that's real world. And our very first successful campaign was, was, was with a company by the name of Bohemian Guitars. And what they do is they take old oil cans, as you can see on my shirt, and they turn them into fully functional electric guitars that sound excellent. So here's the blueprint. They had an idea. They went to Kickstarter. They got the successful money. They did business as Bohemian Guitars. They did it so well, in fact, that Urban Outfitters came calling and said, we love this, we want 200 of those. Great but it's a nightmare. They don't have the money to fill that purchase order. So they went to banks, they went to credit unions, they went to angel investors. No, no, no. They, they had no idea what they were doing. They're selling oil can guitars, get out of here. So <laughs> what they did is they turned this back over to the wisdom of the crowd. So they were our first campaign. They launched uh, October the 3rd, 2013, and with a goal of 100, 100K, they ended up raising 129K. And what happened next was phenomenal. See, they got a ton of publicity because this was history. This is the first time this has ever been done in American history. Wall Street Journal came, Huff Po, but most importantly, a well respected venture capital firm out of Mountain View, California came called 500 Startups. So that was a credibility point. So, what's the way forward? With the 5,000, what we would like to do is create a workshop for you guys. You are our community. We want to gather some of the best ideas that are in this room. Let's say 10 companies, and maybe in Atlanta and elsewhere, and we want to get together and we want to run you through investment crowdfunding boot camp. We want you to understand the strategies that go behind this, the scrutiny, what it's like to securitize your small business. You're essentially doing a local IPO. And then from there, we want to allow you guys to peer review and peer select the company you believe is most viable. And what we'll do is put you on the platform and we'll match contributions to a certain degree. We believe this is the future of community finance. This is growth capital redefined. We're Spark Market and we're here for you. Thank you. Hey, God. Okay. Okay. Great job. All right, Blake, one quick follow-up question. Sure, great job. So, so how, does, you know, how is Spark Market sustainable, or how do you make money? Is it for-profit? Is it not-for-profit? What's your model? Yes, we are for-profit. Oh, sorry. We are for-profit, and as someone said earlier, we're not quite making a profit, but we're for-profit. So here's how we make money. 
here's how we make money, and we're following a model that's familiar with anyone who knows Kickstarter, with one, with a couple variations, but primarily what we do is we have a nominal fee, a listing fee up front, but on the back end, so that our incentives are aligned properly, we don't get paid unless the campaign is successful. So we, we have a, a percentage that we'll charge on that back end, so if the campaign is successful, great, we've all done something great here, and if not, we'll shake hands and... Uh, the range, good question, is between 5 to 8 percent. And it's depending on the complexity of the deal. Um, again, we can do stock, we can do debt, we can do convertible notes, really um, anything that's under the sun. So there's, there's a wide variations of things we can do, and depending on what that looks like, we'll uh, charge accordingly. Great. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our third presentation is called Steam Truck, and please welcome Jason Martin. All right. Hey, everyone. So for about the last 20 years, I've been working to transform public schools. I started this journey as a kindergarten teacher, you know, work with the smallest uh, in Trenton, continue to teach middle school in Harlem, even went back to grad school thinking that was going to be the answer. But even a quick glance at the two pictures behind will show that not much has changed within the four walls of the classroom. Which would be fine if it worked, but it doesn't. Definitely not for all. In fact, here in Georgia, we face a crisis with the third lowest graduation rate in the entire country. That's 30,000 students in Georgia's class of 2011 who have dropped out alone. So I founded Community Guilds a Georgia-based nonprofit to do something about that. And tonight I'm going to talk to you about our elementary and middle school program that is designed to engage more youth, reduce inequities, and close the achievement gap. You see, there is a movement gathering steam across this country that has the potential to transform what and how we learn. And you probably all know it here in this room. It's called the Maker Movement. And youth, even small kids who have access to this, they will be our next generation of innovators. But really what they're building is the perseverance, collaboration, and problem-solving skills that need to thrive in the real world. And when we're using laser cutters and 3D printers and not a textbook in sight, we begin to engage even those students who are you know, zoning out in the back of the class. But here's a the problem. These fab labs, these maker spaces, like this one here at MIT, are very expensive. And while schools are very interested and excited about it, they don't have the bandwidth, capacity, or resources to harness this approach. So how do we make sure that students who need this the most have access? We have a solution. We put that fab lab on wheels and drive it directly to schools and students who need it the most. And we're calling it Steam Truck for Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, and Math. And over the course of 20 days, students just have to walk out of their classroom to the parking lot to tackle real and not textbook problems. Let me give, give you an example about how this works. At our last school, the students wanted to flip the fact that their school was located in a food desert and make it a food oasis. So we teach them design theory, and we use Stanford's design theory approach to do that. And they use cool equipment like the 3D, 3D printer that you see there to ideate and the prototype. And they design a solution themselves. And then community experts and local artists like Aubrey here help them build their design, literally get their hands dirty, work hard, and make something. And the impact has been transformational. The assistant principal of this school said that Steam Truck did more in 20 days than he's seen some teachers teach over the entire year. And Danielle here, said that she wants to do Steam Truck every single day because really it's our only opportunity to use real tools to tackle real problems. That picture next to her is Go Healthy. It's something she helped make. It's, I think probably, the world's first mobile rickshaw designed and built entirely by students that gamifies, and yes, that is a Connect Four on there, gamifies the collection of healthy food. And it's a, just an amazing example of what kids can do if we give them the right tools. So, I need your help. There are three things that we can do tonight. One, winning would send an incredibly strong message to the education community that the problem-solving community, that's you all here, want to make sure that this generation can problem-solve as well. 
two, our goal is to have a steam truck inside every single school district in Georgia within the next five years. That's a lot of trucks. It's also going to be a lot of people. So if there's anyone in this room who can make something, who can problem solve, and can mentor youth, youth we want you to jump on board. Third, money. Regardless if we win or lose, go to steamtruck.org if you're passionate about this as I am and donate. But winning 5K tonight would be able to provide 10 days of the type of programming I just, decide, I just described at another high need school that doesn't have the resources to pay for it themselves. So let me end with the, those two first slides I showed, the old and new classroom. While we haven't been able to change much over the past 100 years of what happens inside the classroom, we have a solution right now that can make an impact on public education. Let's make sure that we give more kids the opportunity to use real tools, tackle real problems, work hard, and make something. And I know that this generation will definitely be able to thrive in the real world. Thank you. Awesome. Good job. Right. Just give it to the next person. All right, Chris, you got a question? All right, Jason. Awesome idea, man. Thank you. Um, so tell me, when, when did it hit you that a truck going around to schools was the way to, to get it done? So, uh, I mean, Community Guilds has two programs. We have a high school apprenticeship program. Uh, and high school kids can leave the school. Uh, I want to have a K-12 solution, so I thought about, well, the maker movement's amazing, but maker spaces, no matter how much I, I love them, getting the kids who need it most there was a problem. Uh, there was a California design called Spark Truck, and I stole their idea. Basically, I said, wow, that, it's a truck with tools. We can do that. Uh, and we got some folks to jump on board, and we started uh, Proof of Concept last Atlanta Mini Maker Fair, and we got our first truck this January. We built it out, and we started programming last April. Awesome. Great. Give Thank it up you. for Steam Truck. <laughs> yeah, give it up. Okay, we got two more great ideas, so stay with us. I know it's getting a little late, but just stay with us. Two more great ideas. Um, next is Brother Moto, and this is Bobby Russell. All right, how are y'all doing? Y'all doing good? This is short. I am tall. All right, so my name's Bobby Russell. Like Jeff said, I am with a company called Brother Moto. About seven years ago, I got really into vintage motorcycles because I thought they were cool. I was in a lot of emo bands, and I needed something to make me like look really awesome. So I was like, let's get into motorcycles. I had about 700 bucks, so I went on Craigslist, and I bought a non-working motorcycle and said, I can get this thing running. I know nothing about motorcycles. I can totally do this. So I took it home. I parked it in my parking lot of my apartment complex. I covered it with a tarp. And every now and then, I would go out and sit on it and just do this. And then six months later, I got really discouraged, and I sold it because I didn't have the tools around me or the necessary like, means to work on it. So I got really discouraged, and I was like, I'm over this. I'm, I'm done with motorcycles. So a couple of years later, I was like, I know what I'll do. I will buy a motorcycle that actually works. And so I bought a motorcycle that works, and it broke down. And so then I got really discouraged and was like, all right, I don't know what to do with this thing. I'll just sell it. Um, but luckily, that time around, I had these good dudes around me that were like, hey, you don't, you don't have to sell this. You can, let's, together, I think we can accomplish something great. We may not have everything that we need, and we may not have this you know, amazing garage, but I think together we can figure this out. And so what you're seeing here is an example of us working in the cotton mill loft parking lot. They did not appreciate that yellow rope that went up to a rafter as we're hanging a motorcycle and it's swinging. They did ask us to leave politely. So with that in mind, we said, all right, let's, so we ended up fixing my bike and we're like, all right, well, man, wouldn't it be awesome if we actually had a space where we could all get together and, and collaborate and kind of, you know, bounce ideas off each other and like have classes and teach other people and empower them to be able to do these things themselves. So we started a company, we called it Brother Moto and we realized we don't have any money, and it takes money to have a repair shop, and it takes money to do the things we want to do. So we said, let's just see if other people are interested. Let's build this brand. Let's sell some t-shirts. Let's build a motorcycle ourselves and just kind of see if people are interested in this idea and need a space like this. And out of that, we're like, 
let's just throw an event. Let's invite like 30 of our friends. Just tweet about it and Instagram about it. And we'll see how that turns out. So we threw an event and we called it something fun. Pretty brilliant. So you tell your people you're going to something fun. Anyway, so that was my idea. I'll take it. Um, so <laughs> I'm nervous. All right. So we had this, uh, so we decided to have this event, and it was raining that day, and we invited people to come on their motorcycles to what we called a moto booth. Again, my idea. And with that, we said, let's, let's have people come in. We'll have this event. We'll show off this bike we built and, and just see if people are interested in this idea. And so it was raining, and we expected about 30 people to come to that event, and we ended up having 300 people come through the doors that night. And at that moment, we were blown away. Like, we didn't know what to do. We sold out of everything we had. Like, we just, we were scrambling, and it was awesome. And out of that, we thought, man, maybe we're actually onto something. Maybe we're not just people who are selfish and want, like, a really cool garage like every dude wants. Like, maybe this is actually a destination that the city of Atlanta needs. And so out of that, we said, and the feedback we got from that was the two things, the emails that we got. Where is your space at? I want to come right now. And two, how can I buy the bike you built? So this is the bike that we built out of that. And again, I show you that because none of us are mechanics or motorcycle mechanics by any means, but together we knew we could build something great, and we didn't even have a space to do that. That was us like working on things like out. I wish I had photos of us pressure washing like in a driveway. It was, it was bad. But anyway, don't tell anyone that. We built that. It's awesome. So all that to say, we built this as a marketing thing to you know, show off what we could do, but also because we want to sell that in order to fund us to be able to be in a space. That's kind of the idea behind that bike and, you know, again, the community aspect of it. And so lastly, what Brother Moto really wants is a physical standalone space. Um, the dream is for, the big dream is for us to be in a space where we can have a co-op space where members can come and pay to have a collaborative, like, you know, you come in and subscription-based service, you come in and you're able to work on your bikes. But then also the Moto Curious part about what we're calling Brother Moto is just for people that want to come in that are interested in bikes and maybe have, you know, just a, a time to be able to meet with people and as like a destination space for the city of Atlanta. So... If we had the $5,000, we would put that towards events, and we would put that towards acquiring our customer and having those set members in so that when we open the doors, we already had them in place. Thank you. Good job. We got a follow-up question. All right. Okay, Wade, what do you think? Uh, great idea, Bobby. That's uh, awesome. And I wish someone would do something with the old... Uh, Sherwin-Williams store and little five points yeah, that's there. It. Um, that's it. You know, I'd love to hear a little bit about um, your, any transformative experiences you've seen with uh, fixing stuff, with using your hands and, you know, getting back to making stuff. And if, if I open the trunk of my car, or I don't know what I could do with a wrench. I mean, everything requires yeah. like a computer chip. So... Um, just the idea of making things and taking care of things, if, is that a big part of what you're doing? Yeah, that's a, that's a huge part of actually like why now I appreciate the community that's kind of built around what we're doing. Um, you know, before, like two years ago, or a year ago, I didn't even ride motorcycles. And, you know, a year later, we have this bike that I know that I had a hand in making, and I know that it's something that people seem to have a really good response to. And to me, that's been something really re rewarding, because most of the time what I've done in the past has just been things that have dealt with computers. So for me, to be able to go out around good people and community and actually build something has been great, just knowing that, man, together we can do something really great, even though we may not be um, you know, experts at this. So That's great. Cool. Thank you, Brother Moto. All right, our last pitch tonight, and uh, I'm excited to say the name. It's called Dry Butts. So please welcome Michael Wall. All right. So uh, many years ago, my wife and I were, uh, were foster parents, and uh, two of our kids, Nikhil and Dia, beautiful kids, and uh, one of the days... Uh, Nikhil, he, they're African American, and one of the kids, uh, Nikhil, went up to me and said, he started screaming at, in the house, uh, Daddy Michael, Daddy Michael, come here. So I get up and I start taking off over to the bathroom, and he meets me in the hallway and looks at me with an extremely serious face. And he says, Daddy Michael, 
my poop is brown. Is yours white? <laughs> well, so at that point, I'm like, no, Nikhil, my, my, my poop is brown too. But, but we all poop. Seriously, we all do. We, we all have to go to the bathroom. And we are extremely blessed in this country to be able to know that our poop will go somewhere. It's not going to just go on the ground. It's going to go somewhere. We are blessed because of that technology. But you know what? Not everybody is blessed that way. Actually, 2.4 billion people, that's what the B, have to deal with that on a daily basis. Do you know that people uh, have actually more access to cell phones than they do toilets? Man, you know, it is causing major disease. The diseases that they deal with, man, are, are, are insane, and it actually even begins to kill not only people, but specifically babies. Dysentery, uh, cholera. All these things, and I know in the news right now, there's been a lot of stuff about evil eye and then things like that that are, that are major issues. So that began to be a thing for me to say, man, what are we going to do about this? Well, I began to build a self-sustaining community in Haiti. We walked in and we started drilling wells. We started actually helping with gardens and dealing with things to help people. As soon as I walked in, the thing that everybody asked for is latrines, toilets. Nobody had toilets. We're going around and we couldn't believe it. So we began to build toilets. As we did that, all of a sudden the issue arise that I never would have thought of. All of a sudden I realized this, that babies were naked everywhere. And as we began to build the toilets, something else arose. And that's when it hit me. It hit this. Babies need diapers. Babies don't use latrines. Well, why is that such a big issue? Because guess where you bring a baby? You bring them in your house. So if you're in your house with a baby with no diaper, guess where they're going poop? All over you, the floor, the bed, right next to the water source, right next to the food source. Actually, the babies are making themselves sick. In the hospitals, 80% are being filled up because of fecal matter, because they're getting sick. And I was not okay with this. So I went home determined to find an answer. I Googled and, and searched and tried to find what can we do about this. Could not find anything that would work in our situation, and especially in many third world countries, because you have no running water, you have no electricity, and it has to be able, it cannot be disposed of just out in just a landfill, and you can't keep buying um, disposable diapers. So that's where I came up with this idea, and here's our product called Dry Butts. It is made out of dry wick material. It's very simple. It's breathable. It's cool. You can actually wring it out. And uh, what's so awesome about it is that it dries in about uh, 45 minutes. The outer shell dries in about 25. The inside shell dries in about 45 minutes. And so um, it's not just about throwing a diaper at a problem, but it's also about education. If we can change their habits, we can actually change their future. If we can change that. So we go in there and we educate. I actually have about 60 plus diapers on the field right now uh, that are being tested. And we begin to educate and teach people that not just using the diapers, but what is sanitation? How can they make sure that their kids are not getting sick? That that's part of the reason why there's so much disease is because you're not controlling your fecal matter. And so we've been really pushing that and educating and teaching that. We believe that this is the change. And because of something as simple as a diaper can literally say, millions of people's lives. And so what would I do with the $5,000? Pretty simple. I'd put a whole bunch of diapers on babies' butts. That's what I would do because I believe in it. I believe in it. I believe this is changing um, not only our area in Haiti, but changing people's lives. And so I just got one question for you. Will you help me? Thanks. That was great. Come back Uh, I, think, I think he was listening to that last talk. I think he took some notes. Uh, Brittany, do you have a question? Yes, so my question is, first of all, have you heard stories from the testing that's going on right now? And secondly, what about, um, what about once the diaper has run its course or its lifetime? What do you do then? Uh, it's two great questions. One, uh, first, yes, uh, we have, and I failed uh, pretty bad at first. Um, so we, uh, we've actually changed the diaper three different times, and uh, this last uh, design that we've done has worked phenomenal. Actually, it'll hold up to six ounces of liquid. Um, so we've done a lot of testing on that to make sure that it will work and it does last a long time. Um, 
Right now, uh, the material is known to last uh, pretty much two or three years, even even ringing it. Um, but the the inside absorbent, I mean, it's still going to be under testing. We believe it will last up to two years, um, and and basically that, that would be as long as the child would need the diapers. Uh, but uh, it would. What we're trying to do is put two diapers uh, for each child, and uh, that should last them the whole cycle that we would need diapers for. Okay, that's great. Thank you. I'm going to welcome up our idea competition people one more time. Can you give them a round of applause? Come on up. Line up. Gotta line up here. Just kind of line up there uh, in a row. I feel like in sixth grade, I had a coach who said, put your feet on the line there. Just do that. Okay, so uh, the one person, Jared is, Jared is one of the other brothers in Brother Moto. So... <laughs> Uh, he's here to kind of represent their project. So uh, last night we had voting that happened, and the voting online actually, um, well, there was voting online. And, uh, and the judges also had their voting that they did. And so when it came down to it, there was three winners. And in third place was Spark Market. Thank you. And, <clears throat> And in second place was Steam Truck. (laughs) And in first place, we are going to cover 200 butts, dry butts. But I, but I think you will all agree that they all did awesome last night. They all have great ideas. And I want to encourage you, if you can help any of these people, make sure you connect with them. They'll be in the gallery after this session, and I'm sure they would love advice or maybe some, some any aspect of way, or way that you could help them. Try to engage what they're doing. So thanks again. Great job, Idea Competition.